Hey, wanted to read history for you if you want to just follow along in your book. Um, it's a long chapter, so we can read it together. Um, or maybe your parents want to read with you. That's fine, too. I just thought I'd give the option. So follow along. This is chapter 12, Battle, Fire, and Plague in England. Oh, starts the chapter off well. Um, this is page 115 in your book. So let's begin. While the English were building trading posts in India, England itself was in turmoil. James I, the King of England and Scotland, had died, and his son Charles had inherited the throne. But right from the beginning of his reign, Charles started to make the people of England angry. His first mistake was to marry the French princess, Henrietta Maria. Henrietta was a beautiful, high-spirited girl, but she was also a devout Catholic who had promised the Pope that she would try to spread Catholicism throughout England. Most Englishmen, especially English Puritans, hated and feared Catholicism. When Charles got ready for his formal coronation ceremony, he was afraid to hold the traditional parade through the streets of London. He thought Puritans might gather along the way and shout out insults. Instead, Charles planned to get to the church by sailing down the Thames River on a barge. But the coronation day was filled with chaos. When it was time for the king and queen to leave the palace, Henrietta refused to come out of her room. She declared that she couldn't attend a Protestant ceremony. When Charles's noblemen tried to force her through the door, Henrietta punched her fist through the glass windows of her room. So Charles went to be crowned all by himself. He paraded out to the Thames, but the royal barge missed its landing and went aground. Charles had to ride in a much smaller boat instead. When he arrived at the church, he tripped at the threshold and nearly fell on his face. When he tried to put on the coronation ring, a large jewel fell out and it disappeared. Near the end of the ceremony, the archbishop told the gathered crowd to shout, God save King Charles. But since most of them didn't hear him, Charles was greeted with silence. And as the ceremony ended, a small earthquake shook England. The troublesome coronation was only the beginning of a troubled reign. Like his father, James, Charles believed that God had placed him on his throne and that his subjects should obey him without question. But Parliament believed that its members, who represented the people of England, should make the laws. When Parliament met after the coronation, it refused to give Charles all the money he wanted. Charles was furious. He dismissed Parliament and ruled without it for 11 long years. In those years, he fought wars and made laws all by himself. He even told English and Scottish Christians how to worship God. He passed so many restrictions on Puritans that hundreds left England and went to the American colonies. He forced the Scottish church to use the English prayer book in ceremonies. The Scots hated this English command. In one Scottish church, the minister had to bring two loaded pistols with him and point them at the congregation while he read the English prayer book. But while Charles was making the Scots and English Puritans hate him, he was also running out of money. At the end of 11 years, he was forced to call Parliament back into session to beg for more cash. The Parliament refused to dissolve when Charles became angry. Because it went on meeting for eight years, it became known as the Long Parliament. The Long Parliament wanted to pass laws that would limit Charles's power. But as time went on, the Long Parliament started to bicker with itself instead. The Puritans and non-Puritans in Parliament spent more and more time arguing about whether or not the Church of England was pure enough. Soon, Parliament was spending most of its time talking about God, not Charles. Charles could see that the Puritan members of Parliament were irritating the other members, so he assembled 500 soldiers and marched into Parliament, hoping to arrest the five Puritans who were his fiercest enemies. But the Puritans, warned ahead of time, were gone. Charles and his soldiers faced five empty seats. 
Embarrassed, Charles snapped. The birds had flown and strode back to his palace. This was a mistake. When the news spread that Charles was willing to use his English army against other Englishmen in order to get his own way, more and more people turned against him. Charles realized that a rebellion was about to explode all around him. He fled from London and went up to the north of England, where his most loyal noblemen lived. The Puritans in Parliament took control of London. Civil war had begun. For six years, Charles' supporters, called Cavaliers, fought against supporters of Parliament, called Roundheads, because of their Puritan haircuts. Charles had most of the regular army on his side, but the Roundheads organized their own army using the most modern weapons and training methods. The new model army was commanded by the most fervent Puritan of all, Oliver Cromwell. Two years after the war began, Cromwell helped lead the Roundheads into battle against Charles's soldiers at a place called Marston Moor. 20,000 Scotsmen marched to fight for the Roundheads. Because the Roundheads had promised the Scots that, if they won, they could use their own prayer book. Charles's army was defeated. Afterward, Oliver Cromwell wrote to his brother, Truly England and the Church of God have had a great favor from the Lord. Give glory, all the glory to God. This victory was the end of Charles's power. He avoided capture for months, but finally gave up and surrendered. The Roundheads put the king in jail. They had won the Civil War. But Oliver Cromwell was worried. From his prison, Charles was constantly sending messages to his supporters, begging them to rise up and put him back on his throne. The Long Parliament itself wasn't sure what to do with Charles. Many of the non-Puritan members thought that Parliament should make an agreement with Charles and rule alongside of him. Cromwell wanted Charles and his ty tyranny gone for good. He and the other Puritans marched the new model army into Parliament and drove out everyone who had sympathy for Charles. Only about 60 members were left. This purified Parliament became known as the Rump Parliament because only part of it was left. <laughs> the Rump Parliament decided that England would only be at peace if Charles were dead. It charged Charles with treason against his own country. A trial was planned. Soldiers were assigned to guard the court from angry supporters of the king. Remembering the gunpowder plot, they searched the cellars. The presiding judge got himself a hat lined with steel, just in case someone might try to shoot him. When Charles was brought into the court, he refused to answer any questions, but plenty of witnesses testified against him. The said Charles Stuart, announced the court, trusted with a limited power to govern, for the good and benefit of the people, had traitorously and maliciously levied war against the present parliament and the people therein represented. Much innocent blood of the free people of this nation hath been spilt. The court declared Charles guilty and led him away. Three days later, on January 30th, 1649, the King of England was led out of his jail toward a scaffold built in the center of London. The morning was dark and cold. As he walked toward the black draped scaffold, drums beat mournfully. Charles climbed up and took off his cloak, handing it to an official who stood nearby. Wait until I give you the sign, he said to the executioner. Yes, your majesty, the executioner answered. Charles put his head on the block. I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown, he said. In a moment, he stretched his hand to the executioner, who swung his axe. Some of the people who crowded around were weeping. Others cheered. The executioner held up Charles' head. This is the head of a traitor, he shouted out. For the first time in a thousand years, no king ruled England. Cromwell's Protectorate Now that the king was dead, England was no longer a monarchy, a country ruled by a king or queen. The Rump Parliament declared that England had now become 
a commonwealth, a country where the people rule by electing leaders who will represent them. Parliament was supposed to listen to the people of England and pass laws that the English wanted. But the commonwealth got off to a bad start. Many Englishmen and women hoped that Parliament's first action would be to reform, change for the better, the courts in England. It cost a tremendous amount of money to go to court, and the laws were so complicated that most English citizens had to hire expensive lawyers to help them. Only rich people could make full use of the courts. But most of the members of Parliament were lawyers who liked the laws of England just the way they were, complicated and hard to understand. And although the Rump Parliament was supposed to dissolve itself so that new leaders could be elected by the people, it never did. Four years after Charles I was executed, the Rump Parliament was still arguing slowly about whether or not English laws should be changed. Oliver Cromwell was fed up with Parliament. When one of his generals suggested that Parliament should be made up of hand-picked men rather than... I lost my place. Rather than elected representatives, Cromwell agreed. He and his Puritan friends decided that England's government should be an assembly of saints, men who agreed with the Puritan cause. So Cromwell marched into the Rump Parliament with his soldiers from a new model army behind him and declared it dissolved. You have sat here for too long for the good you do, he shouted. In the name of God, go! The soldiers drove the members of the Rump Parliament out at sword point. Just like Charles, Cromwell had used an English army to threaten other Englishmen. But Cromwell believed that his use of force pleased God. Perceiving the spirit of God so strong upon me, he remarked later, I would not consult with flesh and blood at all. Now that Parliament had been dissolved by force, Cromwell and his army generals appointed a new parliament, made up of 139 men, fearing God and of approved fidelity and honesty. This parliament became known as the Bare Bones Parliament, after one of its members, a Puritan minister named Praise God Bare Bones. It was also called the Nominated Assembly, because its members were handpicked or nominated by Cromwell. Cromwell still called England a commonwealth, but now it was being ruled by his own hand-picked men, not by the people of England. Six months later, this nominated assembly of men, loyal to Cromwell, passed a new bill. This bill announced, Parliament now gives all of its powers to Oliver Cromwell to act on behalf of the people of England. Oliver Cromwell had become the new king of England. He was never called king, Instead, he was given the title Lord Protector of England, and he was supposed to call Parliament every two years and listen to what the members of Parliament advised him to do. But Cromwell certainly seemed like a king. He moved his family into the royal palace. The ceremony to make him Lord Protector looked an awful like, lot like a coronation ceremony. His advisors often called him Your Highness. And when Parliament refused to do exactly what he said, he scolded its members, telling them that he spoke for God and that they were opposing God himself when they imposed the Lord Protector. I undertook this government in the simplicity of my heart as and as before God to do the part of an honest man, he explained. I speak for God and not for men. When Parliament continued to oppose Cromwell, he announced, I think that it is not for the profit of England, nor for the common and public good, for you to continue here any longer. And therefore, I do declare you unto you that I do dissolve this Parliament.